Brothers and sisters, <clears throat> Jesus is our rest, our jubilee rest, because Jesus is sufficient. That is why he is our rest. The Eucharist is our rest, because the Eucharist is Jesus. The Eucharist is our jubilee rest. The book of Hebrews tells us in chapter 4 that God had set a new day because the children of Israel did not enter into the rest that was set for them. And so Joshua had to lead them into another day, a new day that God had fixed. And this new day that God had fixed is not the seventh day Sabbath. That is one reason why we are no longer bound by the seventh day Sabbath as Christians, because it was pointing to something greater. It was a sign of the old covenant, just like circumcision was. And yet, this old covenant had passed away and had become old. And so, we have a new covenant and a new rest that is promised in this new work that God is doing in us. This new day of rest is not actually chronology, but rather is personal. This new day of rest is a person. That is what Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight: Come to me, all you who labor and who are burdened, and I will give you rest. But the rest that he gives is not something extra, is not a thing. The rest that he gives is himself. Come to me and I will give you myself. He is our rest because he is sufficient. What do I mean by his sufficiency? Well, we can ask Paul. Paul, who had a thorn on his side, and he kept praying, begging the Lord to remove that thorn. And if anyone knows how to pray well, I would think Paul would be it. He's a saint. I am trying to make my way there, but the man is Paul, Saint Paul, an apostle of the Lord. He knew how to pray in the Spirit. And so, that, of course, that debunks the whole idea that if you have faith, no matter what it is that you proclaim, that you name, you will get it. That's the false prosperity gospel that is out there. If you have faith, you will enter into the family of God, into the will of God, and live in his will and rejoice in his will. But anyway, Paul prayed for that thorn to be taken away. And it wasn't, not because of lack of faith from Paul, but because, what? My grace is sufficient. And the grace of God, of course, is the very life of God. And so God is sufficient. Jesus is sufficient. The Eucharist is sufficient. What do you mean sufficient, Father Lewis? How does that enter practically into my life that he is sufficient? Because I don't always feel satisfied. I have wants. If he were sufficient, why would I be wanting more? So Martha and Mary had that very experience, very difficult experience. The gospel story today is powerfully human. Any one of us can find ourselves in Martha or Mary. See, I like Martha. She's pretty direct. When she comes to the Lord and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus was like, well, I didn't pack for this trip. What trip? That guilt trip you're trying to lay on me. <laughs> It's exactly what she's saying. Like, where the heck were you 
When my brother, like, oh, nice of you to show up late. <laughs> but of course, if you know the context of the story, if you go back a few verses, we know Jesus was not late. He came late on purpose. Because Lazarus' death is not meant for death. His sickness or illness is not meant for death, but for the glory of God. Oh, gosh. Could you please get your glory some other way? <laughs> Does it have to be <laughs> at my sake? I want to ask him that sometimes. But apparently he is sovereign and he's wise. He knows what is best. But indeed, Jesus came perfectly late, four days later, so that everyone could know that Lazarus was really dead. You know, there's dead, and then there's really dead. <laughs> and Lazarus was really dead, because in the Jewish thought, <clears throat> that three days before that, <clears throat> you know, maybe the spirit was still kind of around, and he's not completely dead. But after four days, that's where Martha was like, dude, he's going to smell, or uh, uh, he's going to... Uh, have a stench. And so it was important that they knew that this, this was over. Not just painful, but it's done. No more hope in the pain, in the suffering. He is dead. And in the Jewish mind, particular resurrections were not part of the deal. The general resurrection, many of them believed in, but not particular resurrections or resurrections before the great day to come. Which is why when Jesus told Martha, your brother will rise, like, okay, yeah, I know. Thanks for the information, Captain Obvious. <laughs> I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Oh. But what a surprise Jesus brings her. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And anyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And that was a great moment of test. Yes, Lord. I have come to believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. Mind you, Jesus didn't say, I'm about to walk to the tomb right now and raise him up right now. He just said, I am the resurrection. Jesus is not a resurrection. He is the resurrection. Jesus is not a healing of an illness. Jesus is the healer. Jesus is not an answer to your problems, to your questions. He is the answer. That is why he is sufficient. Jesus could raise a few people on earth and prove his power. And he, he's done so on multiple occasions. Jesus can heal people and he's healed many. But as the catechism tells us, no matter how much we pray, there will not be universal healing on this earth today. That is reserved for the future. But God acts and enters into our world to prove to us that indeed he is sufficient. I don't know how many times he's got to do it so that we can come to believe that he really is sufficient. Because he is the source of all these good things. He is the source of life, the source of healing, the source of rest. He's not just a rest for a day, but he is eternal rest for you and for me. He is deliverance. He is Jubilee. And that Jubilee we receive right here in the Eucharist. 
my dear brothers and sisters. He, of course, goes on to call out Lazarus and instantiates a moment of that glory that he's got in heaven. He gives us a glimpse of it, a glimpse of that power, just like he did on the Mount of Transfiguration. Give a glimpse of his glory that we know is to come, but we are in the desert, and so we walk by faith and not by sight. It is proper now that we walk by faith and not by sight. So we can hope, truly hope, for that which is to come, but who is already here in this mode of sacrament. The mystery is here under the guise of this sign. And so, brothers and sisters, Mary, by the way, is as feisty as Martha here. She says the exact same thing if you continue the gospel reading beyond this verse here. Because they went to call her. They're like, hey, Jesus is here. She ran out and said the exact same thing that Martha had said. You know, if you had been here, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Where were you when my brother was dying? Where were you when my aunt had cancer? Where were you when I lost my son? Where were you when this evil happened to me? Where were you? I am here. I am here, says the Lord, and I am sufficient. Romans 8.28, as we've heard before during this conference, tells us that we know Dear brothers and sisters, we know that all things work for the good of those, finish it, who love God. There are also certain manuscripts that say of those whom God loves. I, could, I can never remember which one it is. And I'm like, why am I so confused all the time? Well, that's because it's both. It is both. And I want to check. Um, those whom God loves, as we saw in the first reading, he first loved us. Thank God. Thank God. Because my love is never sufficient. And if that principle was dependent on my ability to love, if it was completely dependent on me, I would feel so often. And it, the, therefore, the principle would be violated so often. But thank God it is guaranteed by and underpinned by God's love. Hallelujah. God's love. When I pray to God, for example, for my spiritual daughter of whom I spoke yesterday at the workshop and realized that, okay, maybe if I were a little holier, God would listen more and he would do for her what I'm asking. But then I quickly remind God, in case he forgot, that he is faithful. His fidelity, his covenant fidelity, his chesed is not dependent on me. In fact, it presumes my inability. It presumes my brokenness. And so I trust, I rest in that mercy that he has. So you too can rest in the Eucharist, knowing that he is sufficient. Not just to deliver you from a trouble, but he is the deliverer. Not just to give you a drop of water to drink. He is the spring. Not just to give you a few minutes of rest. He is your eternal rest. And you will get to consume him in just a moment. You will possess God. What else could you possibly need? 